It's All Things Considered, and I'm Dave Lawrence. Today we're concluding with Linda Ronstadt, the latest guest in our Off the Road series. Hear everything we've done so far at hawaiipublicradio.org. Just look for the Off the Road banner on the front page, and that includes part one from yesterday. As we pick up the conversation, we continue hearing about the new film, Linda and the Mockingbirds, documenting Linda's remarkable bus trip to Mexico with California dance and music troupe, the Los Sansantlas Cultural Academy. When you did uh, Canciones de Mi Padre, that's how you got to first meet Eugene Rodriguez, the director of that organization? Well, yeah, that's right. I met him on the street, and I had my big Mexican show on the road. I was in San Francisco. And he and the little, this little group were playing on the street, and they were kids, but they were playing so well. And he explained that they had this cultural center over in the East Bay. They were trying to get enough money to go to Mexico to take the children on a field trip. Like, you come over and study with Halal in uh, the islands, you know, learn traditional hula. And yeah, yeah. And the language. That's what they were doing with these kids, connecting them to their... Their roots. ...generation and their roots. So I said, well, I can add a concert to my tour. So I added a concert to my tour, and I gave them the proceeds, and they took the money and went down to Mexico. Just to be clear, so you first financed them to go and do a bus trip when that record had come out. This is a second bus trip, though, that the film is based around then. Right, I got to go this time. Right, and so then basically what? You hire that bus and gather everybody up and take them from California down to Mexico? Yeah. You ended up bringing your buddy Jackson Brown on this trip. and uh, <laughs> He'd never been to that part of Mexico. He was excited about it. I mean, nobody had ever been there. It's not a tourist place. You can't. There's not one t-shirt shop. You right. know? It's just a cow town, but it's just wonderful people and really, really, really good food. And what did you do? You call him up or say, hey, I'm going to do this thing. I want you to come explain that part. I said, I'm taking the sense on this to Mexico. Why don't you come? We'll have good food. <laughs> 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 That's a good sell. He'd already written a song with the Sensotlas, and he loved Eugene Rodriguez. So Jackson and I have a long history of bus trips. We toured together in the 70s. How far back do you go with Jackson? Oh, well, I met him in 1965. He was 17 and I was 18. I thought, wow, I'm here in California. I grew up in Tucson. I came over to California to find music. because They got some pretty good songwriters. So you hire this bus. You guys go down there. How long of a ride also, Linda, is it? Five and a half hours down and five and a half hours back. How long were you there? About four days. And so that Jackson Brown, you mentioned it, that collaboration he did with Eugene, the Dreamer, is that collaboration essentially, did that come about because of you introducing those two, or do I have that wrong? No, I introduced them. I had ulterior motives. I wanted to hear Jackson <laughs> sing with them, and I thought, I'd love to hear them sing together. You've got great ulterior motives, young lady, i got to say. <laughs> I like... They're always founded on music. And one of the other touching aspects family that are speaking. They're, they're a California-based Mexican-American family, and the child is, he appears to be a teenager, speaks excellent English, and I mean, he's, a, he's an American kid, and he's sitting with his parents, and he tells the horrifying story of being five and his dad being detained. He breaks down when he's talking about it. For yourself, what were some of the lasting moments or impressions from the trip that really hit you, kind of like the way this one hit me? Well, that kid's little brother was the star of the tour. He was about eight, and his older brother was the one that told that story. Imagine what it would be like if your father was working hard every day, going off to work, and your mom was working, and you go to school every day, and you come home, and one day your dad isn't there because some policeman came and dragged him away. You're doing nothing but trying to make a living. It would shatter your illusions of goodness and security. It's an inspiring story. There are horrifying and sad moments, but ultimately uh, you leave with a lot of inspiration. And uh, I was hoping to be able to ask a few questions about other aspects of your career. Would that be okay? Sure. The band, The Eagles, we were thrilled when we had Timothy B. Schmidt on the show. He explained how he first met some of his future Eagle bandmates like Don Henley, Glenn Fry, and others when he was working on a project backing you. Well, that's right. That's right. I knew Glenn Fry. And I knew Bernie Ledden. Bernie Ledden had been in my band, but Bernie had to go on a tour with the Blind Burrito Brothers because he also played in that band. Mm. So I had to go find a guitar player. And I was living with John David Souther at the time. And Glenn had been his singing partner. They were, had a group called Long Branch Penny Whistle. And I knew he could play the guitar really well. So I said, hey, you want to come and go on this tour with me? Because I need to replace Bernie. And he said, sure. And we were walking through the Troubadour Bar one night, and I heard this band on stage playing Silver Threads and Golden Needles, but my arrangement of it, including the guitar solo note for note. I was looking for a drummer, and I thought, well, I'll go and ask this drummer and see if I can get him to go on the road with me, because they, they knew my album. Right. So I went and 
talked to the drummer and he said, yeah, he'd like to do it. He was Don Henley. So I had Don Henley and Glenn Fry in my band. And they were rooming together because we couldn't afford to have everybody have their own room. So they had to double up. So Don and Glenn were rooming together. They started writing songs together. And then they decided they wanted to have a band together. And I said, well, great. Put a band together. And while you're doing that and be trying to get a record contract, you can play with me and you'll have a big income. So I said, you, you got to try Bernie Lynn. And he's really good. <laughs> <laughs> you can see. And John Boylan, my, um, my manager at the time, said, I've been working with this guy, Randy Meisner. He'd been working with him with Ricky Nelson's band. He said he can sing real high and he plays bass. So they tried him out and they really liked him. And that became the Eagles. Unbelievable. They came over and rehearsed at our house. J.D. Souther and I were living together. They came over and rehearsed in our living room. We went out to the movies and saw a double feature so we could give them some chance to <laughs> rehearse. We came back and we were singing Witchy Woman in four-part harmony. We walked in and we went, oh, this is a hit. These guys are going to be so successful. It's ridiculous. What a great story. And you kind of mentioned it on the front end of the interview, talking about the pandemic. And you said you got tipped off to the severity of it from someone that you had had a relationship with, one of many famous people, Governor Jerry Brown uh, from California. And looking at your history, he also later actor, comedian Jim Carrey. Later oh, I thought it was just a, a, a dalliance. <laughs> I, I didn't know how old he was. And when I found out how old he was, I was horrified. <laughs> You know, he, it's hard to tell. Everyone looks young in Los Angeles. <laughs> I was about 14 years older than he was. We were talking one day about uh, President Kennedy. He said, I wasn't alive when Kennedy was president. I said, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Star Wars director George Lucas. Well, I went out with him after <laughs> Gary because he was older than I was. <laughs> We're still good friends. I'm still good friends with Jerry and his wife, too. He's got a really great wife. I love her. She's got a great sense of humor. He's always been really smart, but he was a little rough around the edges. She took him in hand. <laughs> and you mentioned a Hawaii reference talking about hula dancing and halal. I'm a hula fanatic. I love I love hula in San Francisco. Patrick Makuakani is here with a halal, sort of like the Sensonless of Hawaii here. Well, that's a great context to give it, actually, to compare it to the Sensonless. And your Hawaii memories, the Diamond Head Crater Fest of 2006, was that the last time that you performed here, at least? Was that the last time you were here, or have you been since? No, I haven't been since then. Too far across the ocean. <laughs> it is a long haul. That's what I say, Linda, about coming there. Stay where you are. You're much better over there. I used to watch Hula, and I'd think, it's such a generous ritual hula it's so giving and loving and warm every time i go i it was in the winter time i'd always have the flu and i'd always feel better after i come out of there i think it's a real healing thing but i thought i used to say god if only we had a president that could hula <laughs> and Obama got elected and i'm sure they taught him at punahou the basics of hula i don't think he was ever asked to perform it we don't know what the results would have been but I thought someone who really has a knowledge of hula and the culture and the Aloha culture, they'd have to be good. Listen to you dropping the Punahou reference. <laughs> you don't often get that. So the Islands originally in 1971 or 1969, I think, with uh, Chip Douglas, who was the producer of The Monkees. He lived over in uh, Mailua on the North Shore. Hmm. It was my first time in the islands, and it was amazing. There were still Simon stands and... I remember going to Mr. Cigar's store. It was this little Japanese-owned store that where you could buy a nightgown or some fishing line or some sushi. <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> yeah, that kind of a store. And the sidewalks were still wooden, you know, and there would be a drive-in in the center of town with the Simon stand. It was really good. I don't know if that's still there. I remember there were pineapple fields on the north side of the island. There's a lot of that, but as you can imagine, there's been some development too. But you had played in that crater in the 70s, correct? You, that was not your first time. I remember that. That was fun. I wouldn't want to have to have it so far across the sea. I think I'd get to Hawaii and just stay there. That's a great note right there to leave it on. And uh, I hope, Linda, that uh, first, you know, I appreciate you having done this with us, but I sincerely hope from me to you that this was a positive experience to be on the show with us. It was. You have the aloha spirit. I commend you. I'm giving you a big hug and a high five and wishing you nothing but good things. Thanks. I'm back. <laughs>